And now, here's Les Feldy. Okay. Thank you. I don't need that. One. I got this one. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, it's good to be here. And uh, again, I want to thank the folks of the church. And uh, I guess Russ was instrumental in uh, getting the invitation out to me. And we do. We just thank everybody concerned and for those that have put forth a lot of work to do all this. And uh, after all, whenever you set up one of these seminars, I always warn people when they call and say, well, can I bring you out to my city? Well, yes, but uh, be prepared. There's a lot more work to it than uh, meets the eye. All right, before uh, I get started, Iris did leave me with one announcement that Russ did not make. At least I didn't hear it. We will be having a cruise to Alaska this summer because of popular demand. We thought we'd had our last one a couple years ago. So if you're by any chance interested in our Alaskan cruise, that's July 17th to the 25th, Iris has the brochures back there. All right, all week, ever since I've gotten to Ohio, I've been tantalizing my audiences with a question. When Paul wrote, now you might want to look up and, and see where I'm quoting from, and then we're going to go back. But if you'll go to 2 Timothy, chapter 1, <clears throat> 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 15. And I call it the most heart-breaking verse in all of Scripture, not, of course, including Christ's suffering and his passion. But other than that, this has to be the most heartbreaking statement from any of God's servants throughout biblical history. And the reason I say that is that the Apostle Paul, you want to remember, spent 25, 26 years of constant suffering, beatings, imprisonments, sickness, and the hatred from every direction. And then to come to this end, it's heartbreaking. And that's what we're going to be looking at. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This thou knowest, that all they who are in Asia, now I always have to stop and qualify, because most people don't realize what he's talking about. Asia, in New Testament parlance, was the land of Turkey. Asia Minor, Galatia, they were all in what we today call Turkey. All right, so all they on, who are in Turkey are turned away from me. So now what's been my question all week? Well, if they turned away from Paul and his divinely appointed apostleship and message, what did they turn to? Now, they'd all come out of paganism, abject paganism. Well, they certainly weren't going to turn back to paganism. They knew better than that. But what did they turn to? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at. Hopefully, I can complete it in the first hour. If not, we'll go on into the second. But anyway, in order to, again, establish Paul and his apostleship, and as Pastor Mark mentioned in our prayer back in the study before this one, I told him right away, you said two things in your prayer that just ring a bell with me, so we're on common ground. And the first part of his prayer back there was that we would know how to rightly divide the Scripture. And that's also what we're going to address a little later in the hour. The other part that he also asked the Lord down here was that we become Bereans, now, you want to, turn, want to know the term was used in the book of Acts, that those who dwelt in Berea, which was the next little city just south of Thessalonica, he said they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they went home and searched the scriptures to see if what Paul said was true. Well, you see, this is what people aren't doing today. They just take verbatim whatever comes from their pulpit, whatever comes from their denomination, 
And listen, we are responsible individuals. God has given us the wherewithal to understand the scriptures. And so consequently, we have to search the scriptures. I invite it constantly. Search the scriptures. And if you can see that I'm abjectly in error, I'll listen. But as I was just thinking walking down the aisle, you know, if you could understand how many hundreds, if not thousands, of folks who have written to us or called whose lives have been totally, totally changed, then I have to feel that we're on the right track and that we are not promoting anything that is of error. But on the other hand, I always stand to be corrected. If you can prove from Scripture that I have not addressed something correctly. So I thank Mark for both those requests that we can all become better at rightly dividing the Scripture and at being Bereans to search the Scriptures to see if these things are so. All right, now, the best way to understand the first part of his prayer, to rightly divide the Scriptures. Now, you've heard me give the illustration on the program. I give it over and over in my lectures or whatever you want to call it of how a young man came up to me one time, long time ago, or in fact in my early days in Oklahoma, that takes you back to the late 70s, early 80s in there, and he had been coming for about a month or six weeks, and one night he came up with his wife and three or four kids, and he said, Les, I've been a student of sorts for many years, but he said, you're the first one that has let the Bible speak to me and make sense. Well, I said, what do you mean? Well, he says, up until now, everybody that I've ever heard or studied with, they just symbolically now throw the Scripture into a blender, turn it up on high, ladle it out, and wonder why I get sick to my stomach. But he says, you don't do that. You separate everything. You keep everything in its rightful place, and it all makes sense, instead of jumbling it all up. Well. In order to get a scriptural background for that, I'm not going to take a lot of time in the Old Testament. We've been doing that the last three nights. So I'm going to just go ahead and jump on up to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, I think it is. Yeah. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. All got it? Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues. Whose synagogues? Israel's. Israel's. Now, you've heard me make it over and over. Jesus never ministered to Gentiles, with only two exceptions, the Roman centurion and the Canaanite woman. But all of his ministry was to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people, because of all the Old Testament promises that were made not to the Gentile world, but only to the nation of Israel. Well, as I pointed out in one of the past evenings, if I had the time, I'd do it again, but I'm not going to repeat too much. But you see, beginning with especially Genesis chapter 12, 2,000 years on this side of Adam and creation. And in that first 2,000 years, there wasn't much that took place except disaster. It was just a total human rebellion against everything that God tried to do and instruct. And that led up to the flood. The flood, I take in round numbers, about 1,600 years after Adam, 2,400 years before Christ. All right, the flood. Why? The human race had become a disaster. Violence filled the earth. There was nothing concerning any worship or behavior that was becoming God. And so God destroyed them, started over with those eight souls on the ark. Well, 200 years go by, and 200 years, as I pointed out, I think, last night, in any point in time, 200 years is a long time. Just stop and think how far America has come since 1800. 
of the miracle alike in 1800. It was still the frontier in the wilderness for most of it compared to what we are today, 300 million people. And with all of our infrastructure and all of our uh, wealth and whatever you call it. So 200 years is a long time in any point in history. So by the time you get to the Tower of Babel, 200 years after the flood, don't think it was just a few hundred people. You know, we already have quite a few people back on the planet, but not one of them, not one, had any concept of the God of creation. Even though the eight people coming off the ark should have been able to promote it, they evidently didn't. And so by 200 years later at the Tower of Babel under the leadership of Nimrod, who was a rebel, there isn't a person on earth that is still in communion with God. All right, and then that's when God found one man that he could at least speak to and know that he would respond, and that was Abram. All right, now then, beginning with Abram and the promise of the coming nation of Israel, that fills your Old Testament then from Genesis chapter 12 until you get to the end of Malachi, of God dealing with this nation of people that's going to come. Now, since I got this beautiful whiteboard, I just cannot resist using it. You know, that's my favorite ploy. Now, don't worry about how straight I draw the line. Time doesn't go that straight anyway, and I'm going to use the whole thing. All right, from Adam back here, 4004 B.C. is usually the term that's used. We have the creation of Adam. All right, now then, for the next 1,600 years, we build up to the time of the flood. Now, whenever I talk about the flood, I have to take you back, if you will. Keep your hand in Matthew. Here we go again. <laughs> Come all the way back to Peter. First Peter, I think it is. I'll have to look a minute. It might be Second Peter. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. He makes an interesting statement. And as I speak concerning this book, never, ever forget that every word of this book, now granted there can be small errors of translation, but that's minimal. But every word of this book was written by men moved and inspired by the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. That's why we call it the Word of God. Don't ever question it, because it is the written Word of God. And it proves itself over and over, as I showed again last night, even to the simple fact the genealogies of Christ in Matthew and in Luke. It just so intrinsically proves Men couldn't have thought of that. And so many of the other things that are symbolized and so forth, men could have never contrived it. But it is the supernaturally inspired Word of God. Oh, right, and now look what Peter says concerning the flood. Verse 5 of 2 Peter chapter 3. For this they are willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Now what does Peter say? The world in general to this very day, for the most part, rejects Noah's flood. I've reminded people over the years, if you've gone to university, if you've gone through high school sciences, you will never see a college or a high school textbook refer to Noah's flood. I've never yet had anyone show me. Why? In their scorn and unbelief, they just say it never happened. But we know it did. And so always remember these things, that the Word of God is absolutely true. We can trust it whether the man, man's secular world does or not. So, okay, we have the flood of 1600 after there, and that would be 2400 B.C. 
All right, like I said, that was just a disaster. There wasn't much going on back there. But now we have the appearance of Abraham. Abram at first, but he becomes Abraham. All right, now then for another 2,000 years, which takes us up to the cross, through this whole 2,000 years, from Abraham to the cross, it is for the most part Jew only. And there are some exceptions. Now, if you think I'm stretching the envelope, turn with me now to Ephesians chapter 2. And here the Apostle Paul, by that same inspiration, and we're going to show that more graphically down the road a little bit, but here in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle of, uh, of the Gentiles is inspired to write these words. Ephesians 2, drop in at verse 11 and 12. Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Now he's writing to Gentiles. Now I think it was Monday night where I gave Miles Coverdale's rules for Bible reading or study. And Coverdale, of course, was a British theologian back in the 14th century, 15th century, 1400s. And his rule of thumb for Bible study was always determine who is writing or speaking. Who are they writing or speaking to? What are the circumstances? What went before? What follows after? All right, so every time you read a portion of Scripture, ask yourself those three or four questions. All right, now you get into Ephesians chapter 2. This is a good example. Who's writing? The Apostle Paul. Who's he writing to? Gentiles up there at the city of Ephesus. But it didn't stop with Ephesus. It's the Word of God for all time. And so he's writing to us because we're Gentiles. And so here's the Apostle Paul giving us some pertinent information concerning what we're just talking about, the Old Testament. All right, now look at it. Wherefore, remember that you, being in times past, Gentiles in the flesh. They were non-Jews who are called uncircumcision. See, the Jews wouldn't use the word Gentile. I pointed that out the other night. I showed you from the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul was addressing a large group of Jews in Jerusalem, and he was sharing with them the success he was having in bringing Gentiles to a knowledge of God. But he made the graphic mistake of using the word Gentile, and the moment it came off his lips, he had a riot. And what did they scream? Away with such a fellow from the earth. It's not fit that he should live. Simply because he said a foul word, so far as the Jews were concerned, that was Gentile. That's what the Jewish people thought of Gentiles. Well, here's why, see? So those that were Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that who is called the circumcision, or the Jews, in the flesh made by hand, now here's the whole summation of the matter. Verse 12, that at that time, what time? While God was dealing with Israel from the call of Abraham until we get to the Apostle Paul. It's nothing but God dealing with Israel, Jew only. Now granted, he came down in judgment on Gentiles. He chastised the Babylonians and the Medes and the Greeks and the Romans. But so far as his modus operandi, it was only with the nation of Israel, with some exceptions. Okay, now look what verse 12 says. That at that time you, you Gentiles, were without Christ. And now remember, the other word for Christ is Messiah. So the Gentiles never had the hope of a coming Messiah. That wasn't part of their thinking. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. You were non-citizens. You had no rights to expect anything from the nation of Israel or their government. You were aliens. 
All right, you were strangers from the covenants of promise. Now, unless you're a Bible student, you don't know what he's talking about. What were the covenants of promise? Well, the first one you start with is the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12. And what did it say? I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth one day be blessed. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Well, the one that comes after that is the Mosaic covenant. And what was that? The law. When God gave Israel the law through Moses, it was a covenant relationship between God and Israel. And remember, if you heard it on the program, a covenant in scriptural terms was something that originated with God and could never be broken by man. So all these Jewish covenants were between God and Israel, but God originated them. All right, after Israel came out under the law, they go into the promised land, and then after time goes by, they get a king. Well, the second king in the dynasty was, of course, King David. And what's the promise that God made to David? We saw that one of the last three nights. And that was that through the line of King David, through his two sons by his wife Bathsheba, coming down the genetical tree would be two lines starting from David, his two sons, leading down to Joseph, the legal father of Jesus Christ, and all the way down to Mary, the mother. And they meet. And that was the end of that dynasty or that house of David. But it was a covenant that through this man David would come this promised Messiah, Redeemer, and King, Jesus of Bethlehem and Nazareth. All right, then the next great covenant on the scene was the Palestinian, as we like to call it, I like to call it, and that was the guarantee that the promised land would be Israel's homeland forever and ever. And the Arab world can scream until they're blue in the face. They will never outdo the covenants that God had made with Israel about their homeland in the Middle East. All right, so that's what Paul is talking about now then when he is writing to these Ephesian Gentiles and he says, you, your forefathers back there before the time of Christ were strangers from the covenants of promise. Consequently, they had no hope. They were all lost. They all went to an eternal doom. And they were without God in the world. Now that was the lot then of 99.9% .9 of the Gentiles from the call of Abraham until we get clear up here. Now, of course, we're going to come to his three years of earthly ministry in a little bit. And then after his crucifixion, he ascends back to glory. And then we have Peter preaching for seven or eight years. Uh, I'll just say eight. And then after eight years of Peter and the 11 preaching the nation of Israel, my, here comes the next major player on the stage of biblical history, the Apostle Paul. And now to the Apostle Paul was given all the things necessary for the calling out, and that's exactly how James put it in Acts chapter 13, calling out a people, a people for his name. And that people for the name of God called out from the mass of Gentiles, Paul creates the term, the body of Christ. Now there again, you will never find that term anywhere in your Bible except in Paul's epistles. It's a Pauline word, and you cannot avoid the fact that only Paul deals with the body of Christ. Consequently, only Paul has the means of salvation to come into the body of Christ. Paul alone has all the marching orders for our discipline during this period of time, how we are to live. You don't have to go to books in the bookstore. All you got to do is stay with the book that God has given us.
and we get all the instructions for the Christian walk, our discipline, our behavior, but it also gives us the instructions for the end of the church on earth before Israel comes back under God's program in the seven years of what we call the tribulation, three and a half and three and a half leading up to the second coming. All right, now that is the unfolding of Scripture, and then this, of course, is the kingdom. The 1,000 years, or what many of you have heard as the millennium. All right, now there's the unfolding of Scripture. The first 11 chapters, a disaster. The next, from chapter 12 until we get to the Apostle Paul, is God dealing with the nation of Israel with almost no recognition of Gentiles. They reject him. He goes back to glory. But he doesn't continue on right into the tribulation and the kingdom. He opens the timeline for 2,000 years now to call out the Gentile body of Christ. But here's my reason for making such an adamant stance on a pre-tribulation rapture is because the body of Christ is Gentile it's under grace. It's a separate, set-aside, called-out people that have nothing to do with Israel or Israel's promises, and consequently will, will not fit in those seven years of tribulation, which again are programmed for the nation of Israel. It just can't happen. Now, that's the way I have to look at it. All right, now then, with that, I think I can come back to where I left you in the first place, Matthew chapter 9. <laughs> now, here we've come all the way up through these 4,000 years of Old Testament history, and Christ appears for his earthly ministry. And for three years, he ministers to Jew only, just like he did here, but with two exceptions a Roman centurion, and a Canaanite woman. Don't ever let anybody tell you that Jesus ministered to Gentiles. He never had anything to do with them, and he instructed the twelve, as I'll show you in a minute, to do likewise. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, no Gentiles, Jews. And he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now, this is where I get crossways with a lot of preachers. I didn't say all. I said a lot of them. Because they are just like the young man I started out with. They have been mixing the scriptures for so long, they refuse to rightly divide it. They refuse to admit they're wrong, and so they castigate me, they criticize me, they call me names simply because I claim there's two Gospels in Scripture. Well, it stands to reason. Even the founder of the Dallas uh, Theological Seminary was on the same page with me. He said identically things, and I didn't realize it until someone in my audience sent me some of his statements about a, six months ago. And I didn't realize that Chafer was that close to what I'm saying. But he said the same thing. When these theologians refuse to admit that Jesus and the Twelve, beginning here at his earthly ministry, preached the gospel of the kingdom, whereas Paul is given the gospel of the grace of God. Well, he said, how in the world, and this is what I've been saying for 30 years, how could Jesus and the 12 preach the gospel of the grace of God, which is the death, burial, and resurrection, when it hadn't happened yet? And they didn't know it was going to happen. Jesus did. He was God. But the 12 didn't. They had no clue. Now, lest you think I'm, I'm uh, making a preposterous statement, stop and think a minute. After he was crucified and put in the tomb, if they knew all this ahead of time, were they waiting for him to rise from the dead? 
Were they sitting outside the tomb that Sunday morning? Of course not. And when Mary came to anoint the body and it was gone, did she say, well, that figures? No, she was all shook up. See, she was all shook up. Somebody had stolen the body. Well, if they've been preaching death, burial, and resurrection for three, four years before all this, it doesn't make sense. And so all the way through then, the early chapters of Acts, Peter is the same way. He is still proclaiming that this Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, has been raised from the dead. He's gone back to glory so that he can still come back and fulfill all those Old Testament promises. And it's absurd, and that's the word that Lewis Berry Chafer used. It's absurd to say that Paul preached the same gospel that these guys did, or vice versa. It's just as absurd to say that Jesus and the Twelve preached Paul's gospel. Impossible, because they are two totally different messages. All right, so now then, here he is, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people, see? All right, now come across the page. I imagine most of you have seen this more than once, but in case there's a few here that haven't, I have to use it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. Matthew 10, verse 5. He's chosen the twelve in the first five verses, four verses. Now it's time to go to work. So he gives these 12 men their marching orders. He gives them their directions, as I spoke of yesterday, last night. Whenever God has a period of time during which he's going to deal with a group of people in a particular way, he gives them the directions. He doesn't leave them floundering out there not one knowing what to do. He tells them exactly what he wants them to do and to believe. All right, now here it is. These are his directions for these 12 men as they go out over the land of Israel. And it's plain English. Chapter 10, verse 5. These 12, these 12 men, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, go not. Now I have to go slow because people miss it. He didn't suggest, he commanded. And he didn't say to go to the Gentiles, but not to go. See, he commanded them to go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans who were more Jew than Gentile, but they had lost their purity. They were half-breeds. And so to the Samaritans, they were to enter not. But here's where they were to go, verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, is that so hard to understand? My goodness, it's as plain as day. Israel has been treated this way ever since 2000 B.C. Only Israel is under God's microscope. There were a few exceptions. Rahab on the wall of Jericho, the Syrian general, Naaman, and Ruth, the Moabites. And that's about it. Other than that, God never dealt with a single Gentile. It's all covenant promises with this nation of Israel. All right? The whole purpose then is to present Israel with the opportunity of coming into this glorious earthly kingdom, heaven coming down on the earth, God the Son being the ruler and the King of kings and Lord of lords, but it wasn't listed as a thousand years in the Old Testament. It was just simply saying forever and ever. All right. Now the whole concept of the Old Testament promises was to bring in this glorious kingdom. Well, as I pointed out last night, God has done it before. When he took Israel up from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea, what did he offer them? The promised land. 
God had used the Canaanites for 430 years to develop the promised land, to get it into a high-tech production. And as I mentioned last night, how did they bring the grapes, the lumps of grapes back, the spies? On two poles between men. Now that was tremendous technology. And give them credit for it. But you see, at the same time that their technology was getting so advanced and the production of the land of Canaan was so fabulous, yet their moral fiber rotted. And they had gotten so wicked that God was absolutely fair and righteous in telling Israel he would drive them out using hornets and let Israel occupy the land. They could have had it. But what did God know? they wouldn't take it. And so scripture is full of references as warning to you and me tonight. Don't be like Israel at Kadesh Barnea and refuse the offer of God because of your unbelief. The unbelief is the only sin that will condemn a human being. Not his drunkenness, not his murder, not his immorality, it's his unbelief. Because you see, if he would take the opposite approach of unbelief, it would be faith. And faith by God's grace can save to the uttermost. And we've seen it happen. The grace of God. You know, I got a little quip that I, I use every once in a while. came up again yesterday when people were talking about some young fellow who had just suddenly died. Well, whenever we're not real sure of their relationship with Jesus Christ, we don't just automatically judge them into the devil's hell because, and here's my little clip, this old cowboy had been wild and wicked, and he got thrown from his horse, broke his neck, and died. And so all his friends were lamenting that he was in hell because of his life, but one old boy says, now wait a minute. Maybe between the stirrup and the ground, the grace of God he found. <laughs> now, that's, that's stretching the envelope, I know. But see, this is what we have to understand. That yes, I believe in deathbed conversions. I had a young lady in Chicago who came to know the Lord through our program an ex-Catholic now. And she was so concerned about her family. Well, she got all of her immediate family to come to the Lord, but she had this elderly grandfather. And over the years, he was rough and ruddy. Oh, he was Catholic, but he had nothing spiritually. So she went to visit him knowing that he was dying. And I think the first time she went to see him, it was about three weeks before he died, but she went back again, just a day or two before he died, and led him to the Lord. Well, granted, we look at it as a wasted life, but yet that's a life that God bought with his shed blood. And so we never sell anybody absolutely short. Only God knows. See, now I don't proclaim an easy believism. No way, shape, or form. Because I want people to understand that when you enter into this gospel that Paul presents, you have to expect that your life is going to be totally changed and turned around. You don't just make a, a declaration of faith and then keep right on living like you did before. That's not the real thing. But when we make a salvation experience with Jesus Christ based on his work of the cross, that you better expect you're going to have a whole different life. Okay, but I'm jumping ahead. Now, Jesus begins his ministry amongst the nation of Israel. Jesus himself never left the borders of Israel. Now, people sometimes say, well, what about when he went to the Gadara? Well, that was still part of ancient Israel. So he never left the borders of Israel. He ministered only to Israel, as I've already said twice, two people. All right, so what was this gospel of the kingdom that he told the twelve to proclaim to Israel? Well, the 
plainest place to pick it up is in Matthew 16. And now we're at the end of his earthly ministry. And he's up in northern Israel with his 12 disciples. And they're about to change direction and head back south, go up to Jerusalem for Passover and his crucifixion. Now look at the setting. Just Jesus and the 12. And he asks them a pertinent question. And he says, verse 13, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who am I? You remember last night I told you about the fellow who came up one night and asked me, who in the world is Jesus Christ? Well, it shocked me. But on the other hand, it taught me something. There are vast numbers of church members in America tonight that can't answer that. They don't really know who he is. Well, see, that was the heart of the kingdom gospel, that Israel was to understand who Jesus of Nazareth really was. And so this is why he's checking the 12. Whom do people in Israel think I am? All right, now look at their answer. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And he comes back and he said, but whom do you think I am? Do you know? And Peter answers for the, for the others. All right, now this is Peter's profession of faith, salvation by the kingdom gospel. This is the crux of the matter. Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Period. Not a word about the cross, not a word about burial, resurrection, not a word. Naturally, he knows nothing of that. But he does know by faith that this Jesus of Nazareth, whom they've been with for three years, was the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. And Jesus puts his stamp of approval on him, see? All right, so that's the basis of the kingdom gospel, realizing that they're still practicing all the things of Judaism. They're still temple worship. They're still bringing sacrifices. They're still keeping the Saturday Sabbath. They still don't eat pork. They're keeping the law. But added to that Old Testament law was this premise, to believe that Jesus was the Christ. Plain enough? All right, now then, as you go on up and through our New Testament, I'm going to stop where I stopped, I think, last night or night before. In John's Gospel, chapter 12, where we have, again, Yeah, John's Gospel, chapter 12. For a minute, I thought I had the wrong one. John's Gospel, chapter 12. To prove my point that Jesus had nothing to do with Gentiles. Now, just happen to think of a verse. So keep your hand here in John 12. Jump all the way up to Romans, chapter 15. And even the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says the same thing. And Christendom rejects it. They think he did good. They think he reached out to the whole Gentile world. And they muddy the water. They blenderize everything. Now, I said a little while ago, because a pastor kind of griped at me one time. He said, you make it sound like it's all preachers. No, I have never used the word all. I just say most. There are still some good ones out there. They're few and far between, believe me. But there are some good ones. But for the most part, for the most part, they've blenderized the scriptures, they've gutted them, they've neutered them, and there is no real power left in it. But look, to prove my point that Jesus had nothing to do with Gentile, John chapter 12, verse 20. Now remember, it's this Passover at which Christ is going to be crucified. 
the Jews are gathering from all over the world for Passover. And there were thousands of them, tens of thousands. We can't imagine how Jerusalem was filled with these Jews from throughout the Roman Empire. All right, so curiosity-seeking Gentiles. They weren't proselytes. It doesn't say they were. They weren't worshipers. It doesn't say they were. They were just simply looking for this Jesus of Nazareth because of what they had heard. Now, you want to remember, people were just as human in those days as we are. And so the, the fame of his miracle working had spread throughout the whole Middle East. And so these Gentiles now, in verse 20, Greeks, there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. These same Greeks came therefore to Philip, one of the twelve, who was of Bethsaida, Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now, I said the other night, when you read some of these things, you've got to use a little imagination. Now, they're in this massive crowd of strangers. They're all Jews, and here's two or three Gentiles. How did they find Philip? Well, I imagine the same way I would have found this church if I hadn't followed somebody. I'd have had to ask somebody and say, hey, where's such and such? I do it all the time. I pull into a gas station. I say, now, how do I get to there? I finally got a GPS, so I haven't done it lately, but I used to. But that's what these guys did. As they went through the crowd, they must have said, where is this Jesus? And somebody finally said, there's one of his followers. Go ask him. So it's Philip. Now then, when they told Philip we would see Jesus, what's the first thing you suppose Philip thought of? Well, the command of Matthew 10 have nothing to do with Gentiles. Go only to the lost sheep of Israel. So Philip's got a hot potato. But what's our old cliche? There's safety in what? Numbers. So instead of taking all the responsibility for himself, Philip finds Andrew, another one of the 12. Now you've got to imagine, what did Philip tell Andrew? There's Gentiles out here. They want to talk to Jesus. What are we going to do? And can't you see those two men consider the matter? Do we approach him or don't we? We know we're not supposed to have anything to do with Gentiles. So they finally said, well, let's go tell him. All right, so now the next verse. So, I, I, sorry, I'll get to Romans in a minute. So they came to Philip. Philip tells Andrew. Andrew and Philip find Jesus and they tell him. Now it doesn't say what they told Jesus, but we know what they told him. There's Gentiles out here that want to talk to you. What was Jesus' answer? Well, he doesn't say, bring them to me. He doesn't say, take me to them. Why? He is still not going to have anything to do with Gentiles. And here's the reason. Next verse. His answer was, the hour is come. Now remember, we're only about 72 hours from his crucifixion. So the hour is come, it's approaching, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Well, when was he glorified? Resurrection. He certainly wasn't glorified on that cross. He was suffering the shame and the reproach of the whole human race. But he exploded in glory and majesty when he rose from the dead victorious over all the satanic powers. All right? So he's saying, we're approaching the crucifixion. Verse 24. Now here's the reason he could not deal with Gentiles. Verily I say unto you, that unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it has to be planted. That seed grain will never grow as long as it's in the granary. It will never grow as long as it's sitting someplace in a sack. It has to be planted. And any seed that is planted and grows has to do what first? Has to die. A seed always 
dies, and through its death comes the new sprout. All right, so he's using a kernel of wheat as an example of his own death, burial, and resurrection, out of which then he will, in a future day, become the object of faith, not just for Israel, but for the whole human race. All right, so read the last verse again. Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it's planted, it hits the soil, the sunlight, the moisture, then it'll spring forth and bear fruit. All right, now that was a picture then of his death, burial, and resurrection. But see, the Gentile world, the Gentile world, could have nothing of these Jewish covenants until the Jews' Messiah had finished the work of the cross, gone back to glory, and then opened up this timeline for the Gentile world. And it's only then that the work of the cross becomes gospel. And it's the gospel of the grace of God that now, because what he has done voluntarily on our behalf, now becomes the reason for our becoming a member of the body of Christ, waiting for the day when he will take us out unto himself. All of our loved ones who have died before will be resurrected, receive a new resurrection body, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then God can pick up where he left off with Israel and bring in the rest of end time prophecy. All right, now then, if you've got your hand in Romans, let's just see how Paul puts it. Romans chapter 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was, past tense. Paul is writing from this point in time after the church age has opened up. Some eight years after the crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection. All right, in fact, it's later. It's clear into his time. It's way into about 60 AD, and this is back in 29. So about 30 years after the fact, then Paul says that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, Israel. And then what does it say? For the truth of God, it was all part of God's eternal purposes that Christ should die. All right? That Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, and for what purpose? To confirm, to bring to fulfillment the promises given to or made to the fathers. What fathers? The forefathers of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were all promised, not only that the nation of Israel would come to light, but that to the nation of Israel would come this glorious kingdom on earth, ruled and reigned by God himself in the person of their Messiah. They had no concept of this. Now this they did but they had no concept whatsoever that God was going to call out a people for his name. All right, now then I'm going to run out of time before I get to what I planned to do in the first hour, so we'll pick it up after our break in a little bit. But just to continue on now so that we're ready for what I want to reveal, where did they turn to when they turned away from Paul, just jump up now with me to Acts chapter 9, and I'm repeating it and repeating it and repeating it because every night since I've left Oklahoma, all three sessions in Indiana, all the sessions we've had here in Ohio, I've had people come up afterward and said, Les, I never saw this before. Well, that's as it should be. But that's why I keep hammering it all home and repeating and repeating. In fact, I think I even put it on one of my tapes a while back. Many of you see the bald-headed guy that sits on my front row right on my left. I think he's been there ever since at least the first year or two of our taping. Well, here just six, seven months ago, he came up after one of the half-hour sessions, and I was getting a cup of coffee, and he said, Les, you're right. Don't ever stop repeating. 
I said, why? He said, I just saw something in this last 30 minutes, and I know you must have said before, but I had never seen it before. Well, that's the way the scripture works. See, I'm still learning. Every day something pops up that I've never seen before, and it's inexhaustible, see? All right, so now then in Acts chapter 9, we have the record of Paul's or Saul of Tarsus, Damascus Road conversion. When that raging Jew had been stamping out everybody, putting to death, put them in the dungeon, if they had agreed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. He hated the name Jesus of Nazareth. Put people to death for believing in it. And as a good religious Jew, he even got permission now to go up to Damascus, which isn't all that far from Jerusalem. It's probably... Uh, 150, 200 miles, not that far. And now he comes to the gates of Damascus and God strikes him. You know the account. And old Saul of Tarsus had to suddenly realize, horror of horrors, I don't see how the man took it, that the very name he was trying to stamp out of Israel was also the name of his Old Testament God, Jehovah. Jesus of Nazareth and Jehovah of the Old Testament are one and the same. And so when he felt that light and heard that voice, what was his response? Who are you, Jehovah? And how did Jehovah answer? I'm Jesus. Now, I don't think the average Christian today gets even close to comprehending what that did to that man, Saul of Tarsus. And that's what drove him for 25 years of suffering that he had to serve his Lord Jehovah, Jesus, the God, the Son, until the day he died. All right, now as he has been stricken on the road to Damascus, God leapfrogs into the city and appears to another Jew who is also a Messianic believing Jew and consequently is under the wrath of the likes of Saul of Tarsus. And so when the Lord speaks from heaven and says that he's going to have to minister to this Saul, Ananias is rightfully shaking in his boots. All right, now look what he says in verse 13. Acts 9, verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, we have heard by many of this man, this Saul of Tarsus, and how much evil, how many people he's put to death, how many people he's arrested, how he has persecuted those Messianic believers in Jerusalem. All right? Now verse 14. And here in Damascus, he has authority from the chief priests to bind or arrest all that call on thy name, and then, of course, what's implied? To haul them back to Jerusalem, to put on trial and kill them, more than likely. No wonder Ananias is arguing. But, the flip side, the Lord said, go thy way. Ananias, don't argue with me. Go thy way. For he, this Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, underline that word chosen. Those of you who have been with me all the last three nights, bear with me. We're going to repeat it. Thirty times in our New Testament, thirty, the word chosen is used in various ways and forms. Thirty times this same word chosen. Twenty-nine are mostly from two Greek words. A couple of the others are from one or two others. But this one, in Acts chapter 1, verse 15, this is the only time that the Greek word ekloi is used to denote the word chosen. And why did God the Holy Spirit cause Luke to use Ekloye. Well, I explained it in my January newsletter. We were holding some uh, classes down northwest of San Antonio. 
and we were staying in the home of a fellow and his wife, and she was a Greek uh, native. She lived in Greece for her first 20 years, so she knew her Greek. Well, i got to tell the background a little bit. They were in a liberal denomination that was starting to uh, put lesbians and homos in the pulpits and the bishopric of their denomination. And so he went and got their denominational handbook of discipline, and he found that the denomination had declared in their discipline that they would not sanction such behavior. And so he went into that pastor, and he'd been a, a real worker in the church, not saved, typical unsaved church member, gave a lot of money to it, but he went into that pastor and showed him that, and he said, now, pastor, he said, if this is our statement in the book of discipline, why are we doing what we're doing? You know what that preacher said? Well, Bill, he said, times have changed. He said, in other words, you have no compunction about it? He says, well, no. Well, he said, then, pastor, he said, I'm going right home. He said, I'm going to write a letter of resignation for myself and my wife, and we will not be back. Well, they left, and they didn't. But about a month later, he caught my program for the first time. And in short order, he and his wife were saved, just got exercised in Bible study. Well, in their Bible study, they came across this verse, and she, with her Greek background, using a Greek New Testament along with the King James, she realized that this was a unique Greek word that meant divinely chosen. And I had never seen that before. And so as we were sitting at their table having coffee just after we got there, they went right out and got their Strong's Concordance, and this is what you have to do. Get your Strong's Concordance and count those 30 times that chosen is used and then realize that this one is the only time the Greek word divinely chosen is used. Now, what does that tell you? The Apostle Paul is not somebody to be ignored. The Apostle Paul is God's designated, divinely appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ from glory to be his spokesman on earth during this age of grace. That's why his 13 epistles take up a good part of our New Testament. That's why over and over he says, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, not of man, but of God. And over and over he says, be ye followers of me. Not Peter, not John, not Jesus, but Paul. But then in Ephesians, he takes us off the hook. If you say, now wait a minute. In Ephesians, he says, no, Philippians, follow me as I follow Christ. Now, if you've been in the book of Hebrews with me, I don't know how far we are. I haven't seen the program. But see, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is depicted as the file leader. And I use the illustration of the cavalry back in the days when they were fighting the Indian Wars. And you've all seen movies that how many times the officer was at the head of the line and all those cavalrymen followed him on their horses in line. Well, that's a picture of Christ as the captain of our salvation. But who's the first man behind the captain? The Apostle Paul. And who followed the Apostle Paul? All of us. And so this is what you have to picture. We're not following Jesus in his earthly ministry. He hadn't died for us then yet. And as I pointed out the other night, I hope you realize that miracles, even though the Bible is full of them, do miracles accomplish much of anything? No. Let me give you a good example. When Israel came out of Egypt, seven million people, with all their livestock, what was the greatest miracle in all of human history? Opening the Red Sea. What a miracle. They walked on dry land. The water walled up. 
And it must have been a wide area for that many people to go through in short order. But God's timing is just as big a miracle as separating the water. He held that water at bay until not only was the last Jew out of the east side, but the last Egyptian was in from the west side, and the water came back. So what have you got? Israel's safe on the other side. Their enemies drowned in the Red Sea. What a miracle. But in a matter of weeks, as they've now settled down around Mount Sinai and Moses is up receiving instructions from the Lord in the mountain, what's Israel doing? Worshiping the golden calf in abject pagan immoral behavior. How in the world could they with the memory of such a miracle? But they did. Jesus performed miracles every day, I think, for three, day, three years. The last verse in the book of John says that if all his miracles would be recorded on paper, it would be more than the world could hold. Did it do any good? What was the result of his three years of miracles? Crucify him. See? And you come on down to our own present day. All the so-called miracles that people think they're doing. Is it really changing America? No. It doesn't do that much good. So always remember, always remember that the greatest miracle of all was when he chose this apostle to go out into the Gentile world and not present Jesus as the king of the kingdom, but as the head of the body. Now that's all Paul ever uses, that he is the head of the body. We are members of the body. And you cannot get into the body of Christ short of saving faith, not in his miracles, not in his earthly ministry, but in his finished work of the cross. Take a break and we'll finish up our last hour. <laughs> 